Okay, so we're going to talk a talk about a new topic, uh, which is what is called as fluidization. Okay. Um, okay, or what are called as fluidized beds. Um, again, uh, like uh, uh, packed bed column, you know, packed columns, uh, fluidized bed concept is again uh, is something that is again used for uh, you know solid liquid or solid fluid contact, uh, and it has a lot of applications in uh, the industry. Uh, one of the example that I showed in the previous class was looking at what is called as a, a fluidized bed coating. Okay, uh, if you have say some particles in the fluid, I was talking about an application in coatings where uh, uh, if you really want to have a like say you have a solid particle, say it could be uh, say for example a drug particle or something like API okay, which is a active pharmaceutical ingredient and if you want to coat it with a thin layer of you know some other material okay and that some other material could be um, it can be uh, a material which is kind of taste masking because you know a lot of you know uh, like say paracetamol if you take it as a little sour right you know it's a little bitter okay so i can have a coating of some other material which is a inert material uh, which you can consume like maybe a starch layer for example right um, uh, it could be used in the case of uh, taste masking or you could also have a case where i would like to have a layer of something on the particle surface which may help in what is called as a controlled release Okay, that means somebody takes a pill and you would like to have that drug release into the body over an extended, pe extended period of time. Okay, what people do is they make this coating and you know you can play with the coating material. You now I can maybe work with you know again the concept that permeability we talked about right yesterday that comes into picture depending upon you know how porous the membranes are you know I can basically control the amount of release that happens over, over a period of time. Okay, so there are a lot of applications of you know fluidization. And one application, you know, uh, is in coating industry where people would like to look at coating of, you know, some material on a particle, for example. Okay. Um, now, so we've looked at uh, uh, pack bed, right? So uh, pack bed essentially is a, is a col long column. We said, you know, there is, you know, support plate at the bottom, something like that, right? And you have particles that are basically filled in the column. Okay. Typically, what happens in, in the packed bed, you know, there's actually a, a something at the top, which basically, uh, uh, you know, restrains the solid from going. You know, if you if you're using fluid at a very very high velocity, it could so happen that you know the particles can be carried away, right? So to avoid that, there's basically some structures at the top to 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 continue to have the particles in a packed bed state. Okay. Now, if you remove that for the time being, okay, let's say that you know I'm removing that. Okay. And what you do is you are letting either air, you know, or some liquid, okay, into the packed column. What do you think would happen? So I'm going to have a uniform, you know, flow rate through which I'm going to let the fluid into the column. Again, we can talk about, you know, this either, you know, the superficial velocity or the actual velocity, right? So as as an as an when I increase the flow rate. Of course, your pressure drop is going to go up, right? If you go to Ergen's equation, right? So you have delta P by L, which is basically proportional to a term which depends on the velocity plus a term which depends on the velocity square, right? Your your you know the pressure drop is going to go on increasing, okay? Now, what will happen if you continue to increase the you know fluid flow rate, right? At some point, you're going to reach a state where the particles are going to break contact with e with each other and they are going to go to a state where the all the particles are you know a nicely suspended state okay so that's a, a packed bed okay when all the particles go into a suspended state that's when you said you know i've basically what is i have, what i have done is i've basically fluidized the bed Okay, so fluidization essentially refers to, you know, start with a you know packed bed. So you, you know, you you basically increase your velocity, you know, enough that 
all the particles in the bed, they be essentially break the contact and they kind of, you know, so in this state, you know, the, the bed essentially behaves like a fluid, okay, the entire fluid particle mixture, it essentially, you know, uh, behaves like a fluid or, you know, if you want to use a more accurate, accurate term, it will it, behave as a, a dense fluid, okay, dense fluid because, you know, the, of course, the, your density is going to be much larger and the fact that, you know, your, your particles are there, your viscosity is going to be again higher than the, you know, the fluid in which they are dispersed, okay. And uh, so, uh, when I said for all practical purposes it behaves like a fluid, you can actually transport, you know, such a, you know, part, fluid particle mixture in, in a pipe, you can actually use all these, uh, you know, uh, all the fluid uh, operation that you do, right, you know, draining of these fluids through valves, everything can be done, okay. For all practical purposes, this, you know, fluid, particles in a fluid state behave like a, a liquid, okay. Now, um, now, one of the the questions that people ask, you know, when you are working with fluidized bed is what should be the, the minimum velocity, okay, what should be the, the minimum velocity that I should be using for me to go from a, a packed state to a, a fluidized state, okay, that is one of the you know, important question. So, we are going to look at uh, some aspects of that, okay. Um, again, we will take the same picture. So, I have a, a column, okay, there is a support plate at the bottom, you know, I have a packed bed, okay. There's some pressure top tappings here. Okay, I'm going to measure the the pressure drop. Okay, and you know it's an open column, so I don't have the you know the the support plate at the top, right? And we can look at so um, say that again the cross sectional area of the you know column is s, you know, and the initial length that you had was say l. Okay, l is the length of the pack bed that you begin with. Okay, uh, what will happen uh, if I start increasing the the volumetric flow rate? Right, so or the uh, not m anymore. So I'm just going to write it as right. So so I have a, a fluid that is coming with some you know flow rate q, and there's a corresponding you know the superficial velocity through which it is going into the column. So I would like to look at you know a couple of parameters. Okay, one is how does the height of the pack bed change as a function of you know v naught bar? That's the the superficial velocity and I would also like to look at how does uh, and I would also like to look at what is the how does the delta p change as a function of you know the v naught bar okay. So, what do you think would happen? So, I have you know packed bed some you know height or some length l okay I have a fluid it could be air or liquid coming into the column okay I slowly go on increasing the the flow rate or the superficial velocity. I would like to look at how does delta p vary as a function of v naught bar and h varies as a function of again v naught bar. So, of course, you know your your it will depend on you know under what conditions I am doing the experiment right. Do I have you know what is the Reynolds number is it the, is the Reynolds number less than 1 or is the Reynolds number more than 1000 okay depending upon that I would have to either look at a Cosini common equation okay or a a Berg plumber equation or a uh, Ergens equation and I can basically plot how does the pressure drop vary as a function of you know uh, v naught bar right. If you assume that you are working with very fine particles okay that means you know the size of the particle that you have in the column is is smaller of course you know I would have to be I will be working in the range where your Reynolds number is less than 1 therefore your pressure variation is basically captured by the Cosini common equation during which you know if I go on increasing v naught bar of course my pressure drop is going to go linearly right okay because you know we this uh, pressure drop is proportional to you know is right it's, it goes linearly as v naught yeah go ahead. Yeah top is free to move uh, but this will happen as long as this continues to remain as a packed bed okay I am only looking at the initial stage where the in spite of the fact that I am slowly changing the, the flow rate, all the particles in the bed are intact, there is practically no change in their rearrangement, there is no rearrangement as such, the fluid velocity is so low that I can assume it to continue to behave like a, a packed bed, okay that is the state I am talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Yes, yeah. So of course, yeah, I would have to overcome gravity if I really want to. So I'm still talking about cases where I'm still talking about case where you know the the whatever pressure that whatever you know the force that comes because of the fact that I'm applying a particular flow rate that is still lower than you know the whatever the gravity you know because of which it's the you know so I can I can say you know there's a gravitational force that is acting on the the entire bed right now I would have to offset that okay so I'm still in a in a, in a range where you know your the if I if I say delta p right multiplied by area will give me the pressure force okay and I would have to worry about what is the strength of that this versus the gravitational force right so if I'm lower right if, if this is more right right it will still continue to you know increase linearly okay so initially what you will do is you know with the increase in v bar okay the your the pressure drop is going to go on increasing linearly right that's a a straight line passing through the origin okay now if i were to look at the height of the bed okay the fact that you know there's no rearrangement in the packed bed okay the particles are essentially not moving essentially okay the height would remain constant right there's no essentially there's no change in the height of the column right or height of the the packed bed you know in, in in a sense right now what will happen at some point you're going to basically reach reach a case where the pressure force that is delta p times a is equal to the gravitational force that is acting on the entire bed okay and at that point there's going to be some rearrangement that, and and if you increase the the velocity past that velocity okay there's going to be some rearrangement because of which the height may change a little bit okay uh, this is a region where you know the particles are going to kind of loosen up okay there's a some minor change in the the porosity of the bed okay and however uh, the change in the porosity okay is kind of offset by the fact that you know there's a small change in the, in the in the velocity so if i were to look at the delta p as a function of v naught bar beyond that point okay it will continue to remain constant okay uh, the reason why it appears that you know it, it's it's remaining constant is because you're really talking about a very large change in the the pressure drop when it is in a, a fixed bed state okay of course we know that you know if with the increase in the velocity of the you know the fluid with which i'm letting the fluid into the column the frictional force are going to increase right however that change okay that small increase that you would ideally see okay it is not seen because you know the in this range the pressure drop is much much larger therefore essentially if you were to plot delta p versus v naught bar you will essentially get a, a straight line in the initial stage and for you know it it will remain more or less constant beyond a particular stage yeah go ahead mm -hmm. Yeah, so of course, you know, when it goes to the fluidized state, you know, you don't have any contact between the particles anymore. Okay, so whatever losses that comes because of the fact, you know, there's of course there's a, a fluid particle contact area because of which there's definitely going to be some losses. Okay, but those losses are basically very negligible compared to the the loss that would happen when when, when they're in a uh, packed state. Okay, now beyond this point, if you go on increasing the the uh, v naught, you know, the the superficial velocity, your your height would go linearly with with the not bar okay so that that means beyond this point your bed is going to continue to expand okay and there's going to be a, a linear increase in the, the height of the bed as a function of time okay now when i say height of the bed i'm talking about height of the fluidized bed right not the packed bed anymore because all the particles have lost contact okay they're in a fluidized state and beyond this point is when i said you know there's a fluidization has happened okay now when people reverse the flow okay so now this is the point where i said this is the point where your delta p multiplied by a is equal to your fg okay that's the point where you know where, where the pressure drop across the bed okay the pressure force basically count, is counterbalanced by the the gravi net gravitational force that is acting on the bed now if you reverse the flow okay what is going to happen is it is going to trace this path back okay but however this the drop in the pressure drop starts to ha happen a little earlier than what, hap what you know what happened earlier so your pressure drop 
for the decreasing case is going to be something like this. So, if I were to redraw this, let me just do that quickly. Okay, so I am going to draw that, that is your linear variation in the in the beginning, okay. That is when you are increasing, when you are decreasing, so the decrease starts happening from here and then it becomes 0, okay. Um, and if you look at the way the height changes as a function of uh, you know v naught v naught bar, so that constant height you basically get here. Um, that is because of the fact that you know, there is a subtle variation in the the porosity that will happen you know in the case of you know when you are expanding the 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 bed okay. So, uh, all I am trying to say is you know the porosity okay at in the beginning okay or the porosity of the pack bed when I started off with okay and the porosity of the bed okay when I trace back there is a subtle change in the porosity okay. That subtle change in the porosity is what leads to these minor changes but however otherwise the behavior is exactly very similar okay yeah go ahead. What is that? This is the height of the fluidized bed. So, so, so uh, what is that? Uh, I mean so whether it is a okay. So, his question is that you know I have a column here right. Now, I have fluidized the bed. So, there are going to be particles everywhere right. Now, you know he is asking a question as to you know is there a, a range over which you know there is a you know basically I am talking about the interface between you know the fluidized bed and you know the clear fluid right. If you look at if, if you look at in that context is that very sharp it will depend on you know what kind of particles are you working with okay. If you really have a perfectly monodispersed particle I would expect it to be a very sharp interface okay. But however if the moment you have a, a size range okay or a polydispersed sample or you know a bidispersed sample of course you know this you know deviation is um, this uh, you know uh, very clear interface is going to be a little bit you know uh, blurred for example okay yeah. So, I am so when I said this h I am in in the so I am basically talking about uh, what is the height up to which the particles are basically suspended in the fluid okay that is uh, that height uh, corresponds to okay. Uh, now, what I can do is I can actually get an expression for the minimum fluidization velocity that you know that v naught m bar okay which is the the minimum fluidization velocity and uh, typically what people do is when they do experiments. So, so this vertical line that I am drawing okay uh, the velocity corresponding to that is what is called as a, a minimum fluidization velocity okay that is if you are increasing the the you know your v naught bar which is the superficial velocity right. So, at some point in the uh, your delta p versus uh, um, sorry delta p versus v naught bar right. So, at the point where you start decreasing uh, at the point where you you are seeing a decrease in the delta p in the second cycle okay or at the point where you are seeing a, a constant height versus v naught bar in the second cycle right. So, your first case you start with a fluid pack bed you go into a, a fluidized state okay. In the second cycle you start with a fluidized state and you go back into the packed state okay. So, this the velocity that corresponds to this particular line is what is called as a, a minimum fluidization velocity and one of the way of getting uh, you know expression for that minimum fluidization velocity is that you basically equate the the pressure forces right. So, your delta p times s which is the 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 pressure drop across the pack bed okay multiplied by s which is the uh, the surface area or the cross section area of the bed right that should be equal to the gravitational force and because of the fact that you know you only have a uh, fraction of the bed with solids. So, 1 minus epsilon is going to give me the fraction of the solid that I have in the bed right multiplied by rho p minus rho which is the um, density difference right because you know I would have to worry about this is the net gravitational force acting right I would have to worry about the, the rho p minus rho that is a rho of the fluid right because there is a buoyancy as well right uh, times g right. Um, and so, now if you look at this so if I and times l as well right your l which is so if I want if I want to talk in terms of right is, is it okay. So, this is uh, there is also s here right okay that is your surface 
okay, sir, cross section area multiplied by length that will give me the volume, okay, right, multiplied by 1 minus epsilon will give me the volume of the solid that I have in the bed, okay, multiplied by rho p minus rho is what gives you the, um, the net gravitational force, right, multiplied by of course the gravitational constant, right. So, I can get this out, right, therefore I can write delta p by L as g times 1 minus epsilon into rho p minus rho, okay. So, when this happens, that is when you know you start seeing a, a variation in the, the height of the column, right. So, height of the column in you know was initially constant, the point where I start seeing a you know the increase in the height of the bed, okay, at that point is when you know you have this the pressure force equal to the gravitational force, okay, that is what uh, this expression, is expression corresponds to, okay. Now, yeah, go ahead, what is that? Yeah, no, at, at the, before it starts, that is L, right, correct, yeah. So, but you know, as I said, right, there is only a subtle change in the height, okay. I mean, you know, you are basically talking about, you know, a very small fraction, okay. Um, you know, so practically you can neglect that small difference in the, you know, L to B, okay. You are talking about this uh, delta P versus V naught bar or the other one? Correct. So, so this line, okay, let me make it clear, right. So, let me just rub this here, okay. Let us do that, okay. Your height was constant, right, to begin with, okay. There is a small change here, okay. And when you are reversing it back, it is going to come back like that, right. That is your height. Okay, so that point here and the point where the pressure drop starts falling in the second cycle that should coincide with that and the veloc velocity corresponding to that is what is called as a minimum fluidization velocity. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, um, so people have come, come up with the different procedures for doing it. Okay, so this is one of the guidelines for doing it, but you know we are going to get an expression for V naught bar m. Okay, let us look up. So, one of the things that you can do is again, you know, is there a, a large variation in the velocity across this? Not much. Okay, so I mean, you know, I would worry about you know whether you choose this or this if the difference between you know V naught bar that you would get would be really, really large, you know, but okay. So, I am basically talking, talking to you about a procedure that is used experimentally for obtaining the you know the minimum fluidization velocity, okay. Okay, so now at the minimum fluidization velocity, uh, the epsilon that is the porosity of the bed is typically denoted by, by e epsilon m which is the, the porosity of the bed at the point of fluidization, okay. And the point when the fluidization starts to occur is, is typically uh, kind of uh, uh, you know referred by a, ta ta a term called incipient fluidization, okay. That is the point at which the fluidization starts happening, okay. Now, what I can do is I can write an expression for delta P by L from Ergen's equation, okay. I can equate that to this, you know, the right hand side. So, therefore, what I can do is I can write 150 times uh, mu V naught bar, okay, into 1 minus epsilon M whole square, right, divided by phi s square into dp square into epsilon m cube that was the, the first term in the Ergen's equation, okay. And 1.75 into rho times v naught, okay. Of course, now it is going to be m because it is a minimum fluidization velocity, right. Again m here into 1 minus epsilon m divided by phi s into dp into epsilon m to the power of 3 should be equal to g times 1 minus epsilon m into rho p minus rho, okay. Um, yeah, so that is the, so if you can, so you can solve this and you can actually obtain an expression for, you know, it is a, it's a quadratic in V naught bar m, okay. And uh, there are ways by which I can actually calculate what is V in epsilon m, you know, if you know the properties of the 
the party that you're working with, okay, basically I can substitute all of that. If you, if you know the, you know, the fluid that you're using for your operation, I can actually calculate what is the, the V naught bar M, okay, that's the, the minimum fluidization velocity, that's the velocity with which I should be operating to achieve a, a fluidization state, right. Now it turns out that, one, one, yeah, go ahead. It's a general equation that is applicable for the entire, no, no, I, you can do that, right, it's okay, I mean, with this I can actually go back and I can also look at two limiting cases as well, right. All I'm trying to say here is that, you know, you can look at a general expression, okay, it's not necessary that, you know, so when I talked about, you know, the experimental way of, um, you know, when I talked about this, right, I just took a simple case of, you know, how, so uh, otherwise I, I would have to maybe, you know, um, so if I did not consider the, um, like say, cosine common equation, okay, I could still draw this plot, okay, how does the pressure drop change as a function of, you know, V naught bar, I can, you know, work it out, right, okay. I just took a simple case for which, you know, you have a linear variation, so, you know, it makes the point clear, okay. It's not necessary that, you know, I would have to be working with the Reynolds number less than 1, okay. So, um, okay, so now, any more questions? Okay, no, no, now what I can do is I can actually go back and take a look at the limiting cases, okay, uh, and I can actually, uh, one of the question that people ask is that, you know, what should be the typical velocity, okay, what should be the typical value of V naught bar M compared to the settling velocity. So obviously your V naught bar M has, has to be less than the settling velocity, right. If you have a, a packed bed made up of particles, okay, if I want to fluidize it, the velocity that I maintain, okay, the velocity of the fluid that I maintain to have them in a, a fluidized state, it has to be less than the a settling velocity, right. Otherwise, all the particles are going to be carried away in the fluid, right. Okay, we talked about this elutriation, right, okay, if you maintain a, a fluid velocity such that the, the superficial velocity, okay, or the velocity with which you are sending the fluid into the column, the moment it becomes larger than the, the settling velocity, the individual particles that make up the column or the fluidized bed, all the particles are going to be carried away, right. In fact, you can actually get an estimate of, you know, how high or how low, you know, this V naught bar M should be compared to UT by a very simple analysis. What we are going to do is, we are going to look at the the first part of, you know, your, so this is 150 uh, V naught bar M into mu 1 minus M whole square divided by your phi S square into dP square into uh, epsilon M cube, right. That's your cosine common equation, right, okay, at the point of, uh, you know, fluidization. So therefore, what I can do is I can actually get what is V naught bar M right. What I can do is basically if I work this out, what will happen? I have G here, okay, and rho P minus rho, right, right, and then I have this 1 minus epsilon M here, so that gets cancelled with this, okay. I have a term which is 1 minus epsilon M on the, the right hand side, right, that basically comes down. So, let me just do that very quickly. Okay, you're going to have epsilon m cube here multiplied by 1 minus epsilon m, right, okay. And uh, your phi s square into, uh, there's going to be dp square here, right, there will be phi s square, okay, that's, and I've got it on the other side. And there's a mu here, so mu is going to come to the a denominator, right. And of course, there's going to be 1 over 150, right, that's going to come to the other side. I can multiply this by 18 and divide by 18, okay. And if I look at this part, that's essentially is your settling velocity, right. Your G, you know, rho P minus rho into dP square divided by 18 mu, that's your UT, which is the, the settling velocity that goes as, right, your V naught bar M, that's the minimum fluidization velocity is 18 
divided by 150 into ut times epsilon m cube into phi s square divided by 1 minus epsilon m. Okay? Therefore, I can say your ut by v naught bar m okay, is equal to 150 divided by 18 into right 1 minus epsilon m divided by phi s square into uh, epsilon m cube. Okay, right. Uh, this factor some you know eight point three three or something like that. Okay. Now, if you're working with spherical particles, your you know your phi s is one, right? And again, there are a lot of experimental data where people have shown that you know, if you're working with spherical particles, okay, uh, it turns out you know the value of epsilon m that people have measured is typically in the range from zero point four to zero point four five. That's a the porosity at the incipient fluidization at, at the point of fluidization for spherical particles. If I substitute that value, your ut by v naught m comes out to be of the order of 50. Okay. If I substitute for phi s is equal to 1 here, you have 8.33 multiplied by 1 minus epsilon m divided by epsilon m cube. It turns out that the number that you get is of the order of 50. That means if I were to work with you know the fluidization, I can use any velocity okay, from the minimum fluidization velocity all the way up to 50 times the minimum fluidization velocity. Right? The, the moment the velocity becomes more than 50 times the minimum fluidization velocity, that is when all the particles are going to be carried along with the fluid and when that, that happens, people call it as what is called as entrainment. Okay. When you have a fluid stream that is coming into the packed bed okay, or into a fluidized bed and if that stream is basically carrying you know carrying the particles also along with the fluid, okay, uh, that particular you know operation is what is called the entrainment and uh, typically you would have to work under conditions where your entrainment is very much not there, right. You know you do not want the particles to be carried you know along, right. Okay. So, that is for uh, ut by v naught bar m uh, of 50. Okay, but if you work around this, and if you do exactly a similar ana analysis for, you know, the the turbulent flow conditions, it turns out that you know that U T by V naught bar M that you get would be of the order of. Uh, it goes as two point three two divided by epsilon M to the power of three by two. Okay, the similar ratio that U T by V naught bar M goes as 2.32 divided by epsilon m to the power of 3 by 2, you can work it out, right. All you have to do is, you know, take out the, the Burke plumber part and then rearrange it in terms of the settling velocity, that is what it comes out to be. And if I do a similar analysis, you know, for the case of epsilon m to the power of, to, the, to, to be 0.45, this ratio comes out to be 7.7, .7. okay. That means the operating window for the fluidization, okay, you know, I can work over a, a much wider you know range of velocities for the case of laminar flow conditions. However, if I work in a uh, turbulent flow conditions, the range of v naught bar m you know the, the velocity that I can use you know without the entrainment happening is basically lower right that is uh, what it is going to be yeah. Maybe we will stop here, uh, we will solve some problems on you know uh, all these concepts uh, on Friday as well as on uh, Monday.